their disciples to him along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are true and teach the way of God faithfully, and you do not care about anyone's opinion, for you are not swayed by appearances. Tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why put me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. And Jesus said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? They said, Caesar's. Then he said to them, Therefore render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. When they heard it, they marveled, and they left him and went away. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. In the year 587 BC, the city of Jerusalem was attacked by the Babylonian Empire. And a year later, the city and the temple were plundered and burned. Thousands of Israelites were taken from their homes and relocated all over ancient Babylon. They became exiles. And so now they're a minority surrounded by a new culture with new gods. Now, some Israelites chose to resist Babylon by revolting or withdrawing. Others gave in, adopting the Babylonian way of life and accepting these new gods as their own. And you might think those are your only two options, but the prophet Jeremiah told them to do something totally different and surprising. To settle in, build houses, plant gardens, grow families, and most surprisingly, to seek the well-being of Babylon and pray to the Lord on its behalf. So this is like a third way. Yeah, it's not compromise or revolt. What does it look like? Well, there's a whole book of the Bible that explores that question. It's the story of Daniel. Daniel was one of the Israelites taken into the Babylonian exile. And because Daniel had a royal heritage and education, he was recruited along with some friends to work in the high court of Babylon. Work for the enemy? That would be compromise. Or they could gain the king's trust and take him down from the inside. That's what you might expect. But instead, they take Jeremiah's advice and choose the third way. They serve the king of Babylon, taking on Babylonian names and even clothing style. So they seek Babylon's well-being. But in doing so, aren't they just giving up their heritage? It could seem that way, but actually they aren't. As you read on, the story focuses on moments where they draw the line and they choose faithfulness to their God and resist the influence of Babylon. So, for example? Well, like when they're commanded to bow down to the idol of Babylon and give allegiance to the king as if he's a god. Ah, they won't go that far. Right. This is where you see their true loyalty. It requires them to critique Babylon's idolatry of power, its arrogance, its injustice. But they do it nonviolently by laying down their lives. And so God vindicates Daniel and his friends for their faithfulness. So they would serve Babylon, seek its well-being, but their loyalty was always to God. Yeah, this is what Jeremiah was envisioning. The way of the exile is a combination of loyalty and also subversion. So they're still exiles. But don't Daniel and his friends long to go home? Yes. In fact, Daniel believed that God was going to send a ruler to bring down Babylon and create a true kingdom of peace. Ah, when did he think this ruler would come? Well, at first he thought within his lifetime. But then he had a dream where he found out that after Babylon would come another oppressive empire, then another, then another. And so Babylon did fall and Israel did get to go back home. But now they're ruled by Babylon successors. And so they maintained the mindset of an exile, waiting for their true home to come to them. And they continued the same practice of loyalty and subversion to any new versions of Babylon that came along. And this leads us to the time of Jesus. The empire of his day was Rome ruled by Caesar. Now, some Israelites wanted to resist, while others gave in and adopted Roman culture and its gods. But watch Jesus carry on the subversive loyalty of Daniel. Like when he said, it's fine to pay taxes to Caesar, give him back his coins. But then he said, don't mistake Caesar for God. God's the one who deserves your total life and allegiance. So the way of Jesus is this same mix of loyalty and subversion. Yeah, like he taught his followers to love and even bless their enemies. But he also got arrested for speaking out against the corrupt leaders of Jerusalem and Rome. He critiqued their idolatry of power and it cost him his life. 
But God vindicated him by raising him from the dead as the true king of the nations. The king that Daniel had hoped for. Right. And Jesus promised that one day his kingdom would prevail. And so until then, his followers are living in a type of exile. Yeah, this is why the Apostle Peter calls followers of Jesus foreigners and exiles. He told them to respect the authorities of whatever place you happen to live, to honor and love all people. But then he reminds them that this isn't their true home. They're still living in Babylon. But, well, they're not living in Babylon. Babylon doesn't exist anymore. Or does it? In the Bible, Babylon has become a symbol that describes any human institution that demands allegiance to its idolatrous redefinitions of good and evil. Okay, so we all live and work in Babylon. How do I seek the well-being of Babylon while my allegiance is to someone greater? Yes, Jesus' followers are called to live in that tension between loyalty and subversion. That's the way of the exile. All right, good morning. Um, We are finishing up our Kingdom Ethics series. Um, and, and, and frankly, after, after last week and after hearing from Derek, um, I was telling Rob this morning, I'm like, I don't know what else I really have to say. <laughs> um, so, so really what I want to do is I want, I want to, um, I've, I've got four ideas that we want to talk about t- today. Um, I have some questions that I want to think through, but whenever we talk about this idea of kingdom ethics or even, uh, this idea of politics, it can get a little dicey. So, here, so here's what I, what I want to do. Um, the first thing I want to do this morning is I, wanna, I want to stress our unity in Jesus, not our uniformity to politics. Okay? Um, I don't, I'm not here to make a case to say here's why you should vote this and here, or here's why you should vote this. Um, that's not my case. Um, my case, and I think what Rob and Derek did a great job of, I want us to continue to build up this idea of filtering our life and the life of, of our community and our nation and our people around us through the lens of, of the kingdom of God. Um, if we can set up this filter in this paradigm, then we can start to really see what is going on, how our political engagement can affect um, those can affect our neighbors and those that we love. So I do, want to st- I do want to stress unity in Jesus, not uniformity to politics. Um, I do want to start out with a quote because all good sermons start out with a quote. Um, a, a great modern philosopher and all around good guy, Bill Murray. Um, he's, he says this, um, when talking about government, he says, if you lie to your government, it's a felony. But if your government lies to you, it's politics, okay? Um, <laughs> which is true, right? So, um, so what I want to do is I want to, is, is I want to say this. We should not find our home in politics. Um, your political party, your political leanings, um, we can't find our home there. Because every political party that you will be a part of, they will also stress ultimate allegiance or you, are not, or you cannot belong. Both parties, Republican, Democrat, I don't know really what independents do, um, but whatever party that you consider yourself a part of, you cannot find your home there. So the big idea today <clears throat> is this. It's a long one, so sorry. Um, the church is to be, whoop, there we go. The church is to be an alternative political city, one that serves the vulnerable and oppressed and puts the powers that be unnoticed that they are not the only players in town. It is to be a city with upside down values where the primary forming story centers on a king who sacrificed his own life and gave up his power for others so that now we can offer a holistic vision of true shalom and flourishing. Um, this is, this is how Christians can engage in the political arena. Um, we, we, we believe that we have, and we are part of a story that supersedes all other stories. And our story just happens to be the true one. It is the true story that starts from the beginning of the world when God made everything good and it ends. And we know where it ends, where God is going to restore all things back to himself, systems, people, work, 
the, the creation itself, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be restored back to the way it should be. But I, I actually also want to start with another story. There's, it's a story that has a lot of similarities to ours. Um, if you were to uh, go back to the time of the Exodus, when the Israelites were, in, um, were enslaved to Egypt, um, what, what God does is he does this, is he offers a holistic flourishing to the people of Israel. It's a story of political redemption, economic redemption, social redemption, but also spiritual redemption. It's political in this way. The Israelites, they were an immigrant, refugee community, a refugee minority in a large imperial state. They had initially come as refugees and found some welcome, but eventually the government had taken a drastic U-turn. Eventually, economic asylum turned into a prison house of political hatred motivated by unfounded fears and discrimination. This permanent enslavement under political oppression prevented the promise of Abraham from moving any further, so God confronted this state power, this state and nationalistic empire. They had political redemption. But it wasn't just political, it was also economic. The Israelites were being exploited by slave labor on land that wasn't their own for the benefit of the host nation. It was the outcry of God's people that precipitated the intervention of God as their redeemer. God was to give them the land that was their own along with a new set of just economic rules and systems that was intended to outlaw such oppression within Israel itself. And so, as a response to God's deliverance, they were now to live as people who treated the poor fairly. It was political, it was economic, but it was also social. Some of the biggest themes from the story of Exodus um, is one of social oppression. Now, there was a story of some, um, um, some attempted subversion from within by the Hebrew midwives, and finally, what that led to was the extermination of all male Hebrew babies by order of the government. So when God delivered his people from this hell of suffering, it led to an inauguration of a new society, one whose systems was, was based where on, on, on the priority of human life and basic rights were respected. There was a passion for social justice that was built into its founding documents, mainly their covenant. Through their, though their history, it would eventually show a rapid decline from its founding documents. But there was also a spiritual deliverance. When God redeemed Israel out of bondage, he redeemed them not only from this physical slavery, but also from the avail for the uh, possibility to worship their own God the way that they're supposed to, to worship the God of the world. It wasn't just out of slavery or economic oppression, but it was also into this covenantal relationship with Yahweh. The Exodus was a, move, a movement away from slavery of the old gods to service of Yahweh. So we see just in this story, we see a lot of similarities with today. We see systems that, aren't, that don't always work. We see... Um, we, we see this idea of individualism coming in and becoming selfish and, self, uh, and having this idea of self-autonomy and wanting to keep things for ourselves and build our own empires. We see exploitation of the poor and the outcast, but we have to understand that God has a compassion and a concern for people that are suffering under oppression. And because God has this slavery for justice, God also has a slave uh, has a passion to fulfill his covenant promises. It's this holistic flourishing, one that, just, that doesn't just care about the spiritual, but one that also cares about economic, one that also cares about political and social things. You see, and, the, and, and what we have done is we have taken politics away from the story of God right? We have attached politics as a way to accumulate power and wealth for, for, ever, for who, whoever's in the political seat, right? 
That's all politics is. It's a way to gain political power and authority so that way you can do your own agenda. But what happens when we attach politics to the true story of God? How would that change how we interact with the world around us? How would that change the way we act with, um, with our ballots? How does that change the way we act towards our neighbors? So what we have to do is we have to start with the story of God, right? We know the story of God, the down arrow, where God has made everything good the way it's supposed to be. Flourishing and justice were at the center of this, where relationships were perfect, where man had a great relationship with each other, with God, and with his creation. But the down arrow doesn't last very long. God's people think they know better, and they choose autonomy over God's good rule. They choose to be a government of themselves. One where they can have the power and the decision to do what they think is best. So what happens then? Then we have the right air, where God continues to chase after his people to show them that, hey, what actually I offer is best than anything else that you can find. So because of this broken relationship, we begin to war with each other. The, the Israelites get taken into slavery, and what, and what God does is he sets a covenant with his people. He sets promises with his people. Instructs them on how to live. If you read Leviticus 19, actually, it's turn to Levit Leviticus 19. I've got a lot of things to go over here. Um, Leviticus 19, um, this is what God calls his people to be. He calls his people to be holy. Now, when we think of holiness, we think of a kind of um, an individualistic moral uprightness that we, that we have like some code of conduct that we have to do. I don't drink, I don't swear, I don't hit, I, what, whatever it is. Like we follow particular rules and that kind of makes us holy. But here is how God commands us, commands his people to be holy. If you look in verse 9, when you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap your field right up to its edge. Neither shall you gather the gleanings after your harvest. And you shall not strip your vineyard bare, neither shall you gather the fallen grapes of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and for the sojourner, for I am the Lord your God. There is a vision of economic justice in the society that God wants to build. Verse 11, you shall not steal, you shall not deal falsely, don't lie to one another. You shall not swear by my name falsely, and so profane the name of your Lord, your God, I am the Lord. Verse 13, don't oppress your neighbor or rob him. The wages of a hired servant shall not remain with you all night until the morning. There is a sense of employment rights where if you were to, if, if you were to have uh, uh, someone in your employment, you were to pay them what they're due when they're due. You shall not curse the deaf or put a stumbling block before the blind. There's an idea of compassion and care for the vulnerable. Verse 15, you shall do no injustice in your court. You shall not be partial to the poor or defer to the great. But in righteousness, you shall judge your neighbor. Uh, a movie just came out called Just Mercy. I highly recommend it. Read the book, then watch the movie. Um, but Brian Stevenson is a civil rights author who, has been, who, has, who graduated from Harvard Law, got his um, Juris Doctor, super smart, really great guy. Um, he says... There are really two types of judicial uh, systems in this country. You get treated better if you are rich and guilty than if you are poor and innocent. That's what this says. You shall not do injustice in your court. Don't be partial to the poor or defer to the great. There's a, there's a sense of economic, of judicial integrity. Then you can go all the way down to verse 33. When a stranger sojourns with you in your land, do him no wrong. You shall treat the stranger who sojourns with you as the native among you. Treat him like he's one of your own family, that he's part of you. Do him no wrong. And you shall love him as yourself. Why? Because you were strangers in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. That's, that's, the, that's the society, the system that God wants to set up. One of equity and equality, one where people, one where you can love your neighbor as yourself and then you can act on that. 
And God says over and over again, I am the Lord your God. Do this because this is how I would live if I were here. And then we get to Jesus, right? He is the one who inaugurates the true kingdom. He's the one who's going to eventually point to the fact that God is going to rule and reign one day and he's going to bring all things right again. But that comes with problems. That, that poses a threat to the current powers that be, right? Even the announcement of the birth of Jesus sends Herod into a panic and he wants to start killing all the two-year-old male babies. That's, that's, a, that's a threat to those that are in power. And then he sends, and then he gives us his spirit as his people, as the next right arrow, right? Where his church can now realize that we have been redeemed, we have been brought out of our slavery to sin, Satan, and death, and injustice in this world. And he gives us new life and calls us to bring that life to bear in the areas that are around us. Why? Because one day, that is going to be the ultimate reality of the world. When Jesus comes back and truly reigns, and the kingdom comes, God's will will be done on earth just as it is in heaven. So we have to attach our political involvement to that story. If we don't, then we'll, get, then we'll end up with what we have today in America. This political partisanship, this fighting, this tribalism. When we attach it to the story of God, we look out for our neighbors. But I want us to be able to admit a few things before we get started, okay? Um, in, this, in, in this vein of... Um, 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 spiritual unity, unity in Jesus, I want us to be able to admit a few things, okay? One, we are being discipled by things other than Jesus. We are being formed by other narratives other than the true story of Jesus. That, that impacts all of us. We live our lives, like Rob said last week, to the American dream, we are being discipled by Fox News and other pundits. With 24-hour news being thrown at us every day, we spend time with each other gathered here, what, two hours a week? And then in our communities throughout the week as well? We realize stories are being fed to us more often than they should, and we start to live that way and believe those things. Also, we have this idea of individualism where it's all about protecting my rights and it's all about me getting what I want to do. I don't necessarily care about my neighbor. I don't necessarily care about the things that are surrounding us. I more care about when I, when I go to vote, I more care about things that will affect me personally, not things that affect the poor, the needy, and, the, 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 and our actual neighbors. We get fed this American first idea where that goes against everything that the gospel talks about. When, we, when, the, when Jesus says, seek the kingdom first, seek Jesus first and his righteousness, and all of these things will be added to you. We are to be a kingdom-minded people. So one, we are being discipled by things other than Jesus. Two, um, <laughs> it's possible that we are wrong under political views. Okay? Can... Can we just be honest there, right? Like, it's possible that we are wrong. I don't have anything else to say there. Um, <laughs> next, there is a point where the effort of some Christians to appear nonpartisan simply obscures a clear vision of justice of right and wrong. It impedes or altogether stops the necessary work of raising our voices to advocate for the oppressed. The majority of white churches in the early 19th century didn't speak out against slavery. Why? because they thought they were being too political. And in effect, they supported slavery by doing so. So as, as Tim Keller puts it, he puts it this way, to, be politi to, to not be political is to be political. To not be political is to be political. There comes a point when our silence and our retreat from from some politics, from, from when the retreat from loving our neighbor as the way we would want to be loved comes across as apolitical, which is, which, which, is, which is basically saying it's okay to keep the status quo, which is what Martin Luther King talks about 
all the time in, Bur in the letter to Birmingham jail. You were okay with keeping the status quo because you didn't necessarily, you, you thought things were okay. Maybe now is not the right time to speak out against these things. To not be political is to be political. Um, so we kind of have to do like a, like a self-take of where we currently are today. Um, politics is messed up. We can all agree with that. Um, Christians have been involved in the political life of the United States since really the beginning of the Republic. And to one degree or another, we have also been involved in the public square worldwide, worldwide for a long time. But just like the video showed, Christians have, have tended to fall into one of two aspects. One, you, we, we end to turn apolitical, where we withdraw, we back out, or we just revolt and everything, everything's bad all the time, right? Those are, th those, that's, that's one way to do it. We, we become apolitical. Another way is we, be, is we become all political, where we assimilate to the partisan infighting. This is true of not just individuals, but it's also true of churches. Churches can become all political. A lot of the churches in South Africa during apartheid withdrew and did not associate politically. So then when, we, when the churches wanted to speak out against apartheid, they had no voice because they withdrew. They refused to address it at times. And then the Lutheran church had no influence in speaking against um, the injustices in Germany because they assimilated to a particular party. Jesus is very political, but he is not partisan, right? The, the politics of Jesus come down to this, love God with all of your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. He comes, he comes and he says, I am the kingdom, I'm bringing the kingdom to bear. I am a king and that disrupts things. So what we need is a private, what we need is not a privatized faith or an, or an assimilated faith. But we want to be engaged in politics in a way that shows where our true allegiance lies and that shows what life should be like under the good reign of Jesus. So I have four theological truths that will help us shape our engagement in politics. Four truths. First one. Oh, I missed that one. I'm sorry. Politics is a great avenue to love our neighbors and seek the common good. I think I said that but that was another point. All right, here we go. One, we are to be formed by the greatest commandment. Love God with all of your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. And this, and this is the story where I think this begs the question of, well, then who is my neighbor? Okay? And we can go right to the story of the Good Samaritan for this one. And I think, and I think the thing that really um, intrigues me about this story is, we all know the story. There was, there was a Levite who saw... Um, someone in the road, they passed by. There was another person who passed by, but there was a Samaritan. Now we have to think of the, the way society was structured back then. The Samaritan was the outsider, the outcast, was the one who really no one wanted to be affiliated with. And it's that person, it's the minority, it's the one who, is, who has been oppressed, the outside, that offers help and that offers healing of this, of, of this person. Now let's put that in our, in our, in our modern day times. Um, a lot of times I have thought that I am in the place of the Good Samaritan, right? That I am in the place of the one who is, oh yeah, I'll reach down, I will help the broken, and I will kind of act like a white savior to this person and, and, and help those who are really needy. It's kind of the opposite, where we have that where we have the needy, the one who's been oppressed, the, the ethnic minority is the one who reaches out and helps the person in power. So in today's instance, in our immigration debates and discussions, this would be like us saying, the, 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 uh, the person, the immigrant who is here without papers, he would be helping the rich, the powerful out of the ditch that changes the story on its head a little bit. And I, and, and, and I want us to get that because a lot of times in the way we interpret the scriptures, just like we watched in the video, we interpret us as those that are in exile. And a part of that's true. We are in exile, 
But a, lo- a big part of that is we are actually the ones in power. We are actually the majority. We are the ones who have made the, the laws the way they are. If, if, if you are white and an evangelical, the, ma- the majority of the times, it, it, the way the system is built now, it lines up with what we are. We don't see ourselves as the Egyptians. We don't see ourselves as the Romans. The ones who are maybe not us personally causing oppression and injustice to the poor and the minority, but we are a part of that. So we kind of have to look at the way we read scriptures and understand that sometimes the systems that I am a part of have caused hurt, have caused pain, have caused injustice to the poor and the outcast. Now, some of, the, some of the responses back will be, well, I've never done that personally. It, I, I haven't been personally involved in, in doing that. I've never owned a slave. I've never done this or I've never done that. But let, but let me say this. God doesn't just judge individuals off of systemic injustices. God judges nations. Not necessarily because every person in that nation has done something, but because that nation, they have set up systems, and to, they have set, set up systems in a way to oppress the poor and those without power. So when I say we want to be formed by the greatest commandment, love God with all of your heart and love your neighbor as yourself, this attaches this to the story of God that says, I have been redeemed out of exile. Now, how am I to treat the exile and the immigrant? I have been redeemed out of slavery. Now, what am, I, what am I supposed to do when I see injustices happen? We have to attach our political story to the story of God. If we are to love our neighbors as ourselves, then shouldn't we know how to love our neighbor? Shouldn't we know what our neighbors need? Shouldn't we know who our neighbors are and what is and what are the, some of the troubles that they're going through if we are to love our neighbors as ourselves it causes us to not just sit in our own problems but to actually bear the burdens of others it makes us it makes us have to know our neighbors know the people in the community that are around you who are on the outcast who are on the outside it makes us need to know how we can love our neighbor. Two, talked about this a lot already. Our political life should reflect our primary allegiance, the kingdom of God. Okay? We live in, a, we, we live in kind of this in-between bubble, right? Remember our concentric circles of um, the kingdom of the world versus the kingdom of God and how there's a little bit of overlap here? Um, I don't know if any of you have flown internationally, but whenever you um, get off the, I, I've only flown to Canada, so I mean, you know, whatever that, whatever that gives you. But when, <laughs> when I step off my three-hour flight into Canada, um, I step, we step into this like middle gray place where there's, you're, there's really no like, you're, you're not in Canada, although you kind of are, but you're not in America because you're in another country. So you're in this weird spot where you're like, I don't know where I'm at, and you can see in the room there's like Canadian mountains, there's the Canadian flag, there's the, you know, the, the Mounties, all those things. Um, you're in this weird spot where you're in this transition to get to the place that you're going to. You're kind of in between two places. And I think we are kind of in a similar thing, where we are in between two places where we see, yes, there's injustice and there's brokenness and there's sin and there's Um, and and there's all of this in kind of this old kingdom, this kingdom of the world, but we also have a different identity to the home that we're going to, the kingdom that is here but not yet here. We're kind of in this bubble where we have kind of responsibilities to both, right? We pay taxes, but here we also give offerings to bless other people. We are required to obey, to obey laws of a, of a civic society, and we are also required to obey the precepts of a redeemed society. 
And here's the issue. Our Christian identity should make us more responsible citizens of our current communities. What would it mean if the church, if the people of God were to live with this primary heavenly identity first? It can look something like Martin Luther King, where he, he realized that his earthly identity of, um, of loving his neighbor as himself when the world is broken, when there's injustices taking place, he realizes it shouldn't be like this. So he, he, he does what is called civic disobedience, right? He obeys his primary identity as a, as a believer of Jesus, and he says, this ought not to be. And you know what? That civic obedience was not just a blessing to the church. It was a blessing to the community in large around him. It was a blessing to everyone, not just here in the church. The Christian has a loyalty and a commitment that is beyond all earthly loyalties. This means that it's hard to serve two masters. It's hard to... It's hard to pledge allegiance to a country and pledge allegiance to Jesus and the kingdom at the same time. And the church has struggled with that. The church has struggled with that. Some, I've, I've been involved in churches where we give um, at least a week to, to singing the national anthem and and doing all these things for, our, for like the country. And I will say, America is a good country. We have freedoms that a lot of countries don't. We have a lot of blessings that were given to us that a lot of countries don't. I am thankful for our country. But I also know we have been responsible for a lot of atrocities. We continue to struggle with problems of providing equality and justice to all. Martin Luther King Jr. talks about um, um, a cup of justice, right? Um, the cup of justice, sometimes it's a quarter full. Sometimes it's halfway full. Sometimes it's empty. But what we want to do is we want to make sure that cup of justice is as full as, as it can be. And we can work towards a vision of that. So, we pledge allegiance to Jesus and his cross as our primary identity. But that allegiance does not call us to be worse citizens. It calls us to be better citizens of our current country. Why? Because it tells us to love our neighbor as ourselves. It tells us to keep an eye out for the widow, for the orphan, for the immigrant, and for the poor. What, what, what kind of citizenship does that? So we pledge allegiance to Jesus as our primary identity, and it calls us out into the world and makes us better earthly citizens. So three, the church is both submissive and subversive, right? If we look in Jeremiah 29, um, I think I had, the, there it is. Uh, Jeremiah 29, Scripture says this. Oops, wrong page. It's, it says this, Thus says Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles of whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Okay, let's set this up. They have been exiled into an oppressive culture. Right? One, it's not their home. They are strangers in a foreign land. They should not be there, but here they are. What does he say? Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there. Do not decrease. Seek the welfare. Seek the shalom of the city where I have sent you into exile. And pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare you will find your, your welfare. God says, seek the shalom of the city that you're in. So we can do the same. We can do a similar thing. We can say, as Americans, seek the shalom of your city. Why? Because we are, we are exiles here. This isn't our final place. But we are in that bubble where we can seek the shalom of our city. John Lewis, who was one of, 
who was a congressman. He was involved in the civil rights. He says, he says this, when we see the centrality of a kingdom vision that's rooted in the practices of a church, we can now envision the dream of the kingdom of God. And, that, and he tells us to be good citizens of our current, of our current world. Even rumors of a rival king, when we talk about this idea of submission, we can submit and love the city that we're in, but we also know that with that comes a little bit of subversion. We have this submersive loyalty that says, we know that things aren't going to be the way they should be because God hasn't set up his full kingdom yet. But we can also say, as long as we continue to preach the gospel and function as a proper political reality, we understand the kings of this earth have a problem on their hands. As soon as the church appears, it becomes clear to any alert politician that worldly politics is no longer the only game in town. So the introduction of the church into any city means that now the city's powers have a challenger on their hands. Even, we, I mean, we talked about Herod, even rumors of, an, of, of, an, of another king will send the powers that be into a... In, into a tizzy. Even rumors of something else that has, that has an allegiance to another kingdom, that disrupts things at times. So the church, is, the church is both submissive and subversive. We can pray and work that the political institutions can be bent to better reflect the kingdom of God. That's the subversiveness. It's not we're going to stab the king in the back because we finally got into the, into the kingdom. It's we're going to pray and work that the city that we're a part of better reflects the kingdom values. Four, the church's actions should be rooted in the already, not yet of the kingdom. And with that, I have this, I have this one question. What are the kingdom values? Love, justice. Want a microphone? You want to keep going? No, it's fine. No, love, justice, mercy, flourishing, shalom. Like these are the values of the kingdom. We are to be kingdom-minded people. That means the values that we have should reflect the kingdom values. And we have to admit that sometimes, a lot of times they don't. And this is where we can be subversively loyal to our country, right? We can, we, can say, we can say that we are people who value life. We value the life of the immigrant. We value the life of the unborn. And we cannot, like, we, don't, we, we, we do not fit into both parties very well. So the church's action should be rooted in the already not yet of the kingdom. Jesus inaugurated the kingdom in his life, death, and resurrection. And though God's people are to be a picture and a taste of that heavenly kingdom, we realize it won't be fully established until Jesus comes. So we wait and we work for the flourishing, for the shalom of the city that we're called to. I can keep going. I've got two more pages. I don't know if it's going to be helpful. <laughs> So what I want to do is this. I've got, I've got three questions. I don't, I think I'm going to leave them, I think I'm just going to leave them here for, for us to think through, okay? Question number one, it says this. If we are to seek the kingdom of God first, how should that impact our engagement in politics? We talked about how we have, we are supposed to have a full life ethic. But we realize that when we talk about the immigration system, it's going to bring up partisan feelings. Uh, when we realize, we, when we talk about the, the unborn and how we value their life, it's going to bring up partisan feelings. But if we are to seek the kingdom of God first, it should impact our engagement in political realms tremendously. We can, we can now say that the party that I am involved with has failed on both of those fronts. We can say that as much as uh, Republicans have said that they, that they are against abortion, they haven't done anything. We can also say that Democrats, they, they're going to kick out anybody who, who has a differing opinion on that. We can say the Democrats have also been 
responsible for the immigration system the, the, the way it is. They've got blood on their hands too. We are to seek the kingdom of God first, and that should allow us to be submissively uh, or subversively loyal to our own political parties. And, and think about this too. When was the last time you spoke out against the political party that you're a part of? Ever? Maybe our politics take up more space in our mind than we actually think. Question number two. Oh, I don't have another one. Sorry. Question number two. Think about your neighbor's needs. What are ways in which we can advocate for them, help them, and be a kingdom citizen to them? And when I think about our neighbors, um, are all, do all your neighbors look and sound like you? Do, all, do any of your neighbors have other issues that you really just can't imagine yourself having? How, were, how would you love them like the greatest commandment calls us to, like we love ourselves? Question number three. Whatever party you're involved in, how can you right now speak and act subversively to influence, to change them, to better reflect kingdom values. Now, um, we can talk, when uh, preachers use a lot of guilt, right? We're good at that. We, we like to lay it on thick and heavy at times. I have probably done that. I probably have done that today, so forgive me. But what I want to do is this. I want to give us a reminder of how we can actually live this way. And it's by closing with God's story. God has created this world to experience shalom and flourishing in a holistic way. We have broken that relationship with God because we sought our autonomy other than God's rule. And yet he still chases after us. He redeems them out of Egypt and gives them the law on how to live. When that doesn't work like it should, we've asked for other kings and rulers to come in. That doesn't work then God sends Jesus who perfectly embodies these kingdom values. Jesus, who is God in flesh, he lays aside his power and creates these little pockets of heaven as he is healing and serving and feeding the poor and the marginalized and telling others that God's kingdom is at hand. So repent and believe. He then suffers a horrible death on the cross and rises again sending ripple waves throughout the powers that be. And now he sends us, his church, powered by his spirit on that same mission, the holistic mission of Jesus, one that cares about justice and righteousness, a mission that is God's, one that cares about the suffering and the oppression of your neighbors, one that cares about the abolishment of slavery and discrimination, one that cares about the marginalized, the sojourner, the exiles, and the immigrant. God has called us out of our sin and calls us to serve a new master, who is Jesus himself. And that master has saved us from all the bondage. He cares about the poor. He cares about the needy. And our only response should be this, that we reflect those same kingdom values. That we reflect those same kingdom values. Now, part of what we want to do through our adult equipping this, this year is to help us think through what those kingdom values should be. And we can realize that politics is messy, right? I was, I was having a conversation with uh, some, of the, some of the folks in our MC a couple weeks ago, and we were talking about the, um, the homeless camping ban that was ruled unconstitutional in downtown Denver, right? Where we can say we truly value the, those that are, that are experiencing homelessness, we truly value the, those folks because they are made in the image of God. They are beautiful. They are awesome. And we have a lot to learn. But we, but we also realize that it's a, it's a tricky situation. So what we can do is we can say we value them. We welcome them. We want them to thrive and flourish. Let's talk about how that can happen. We can disagree on how that can happen. And that's okay. But we can all affirm we are all made in God's image. We are made to flourish. We are made to thrive. 
we realize that doesn't always happen, let's work on that together. Let's disagree in community where you can have differing opinions and we, can, and we still love you. <laughs> Let's figure out ways to better reflect the kingdom values as this church goes out and we, as we are cast out into this city. Let's figure out how we can reflect those kingdom values to our neighbors. And we do this because we are empowered by the Spirit of God who has redeemed us and now sets us free to love and serve as he has served us. So part of how we do that, part of how we preach this identity of citizens of heaven is every week we take part in the table. We take part in a table that says Jesus has come as, as uh, setting up a new kingdom and he has said, become, this is what it means to become a heavenly citizen. This is what it means to live as Jesus would have lived. As though you were once exiles, I have brought you out and redeemed you. So now go out and do the same. 